Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's live stream. I'm joined today with Michaela Woods. Michaela, do you want to say hi? Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. So welcome to this session. We're really excited to have you. Um, I wanted to start by saying that we are changing our live streams away from uh, tutorials more into explainers on different topics in in retrieval augmented generation specifically right now, but generative AI and vector databases overall. So what we feel is that the space is moving incredibly fast. And as good members of the community, we want to give back to the community and make sure that we are sharing our knowledge as best we can. We are researching different topics and experimenting, um, as I'm sure a lot of you are. And we want to take our learnings and share that with you to speed up your learning of these vector databases and generative AI applications. So with that, today we're going to be talking about evaluating RAG performance and accuracy. So what we were talking about, Michaela and I, is um, how do I know that RAG is, ret is returning the best results? I mean, I, I can get a similarity score on my similarity search. Um, I can kind of read the text that's coming from my LLM and and I can determine, hey, this looks right or this looks wrong, but it's all very squishy. It's all very subjective. So what are some quantifiable ways? What are some um, what are some best practices for actually evaluating uh, if we're getting good results? And what that turned into is a conversation on, well, let's just talk about evaluation methods. So Michaela today has prepared uh, a set of content on different evaluation metrics and methods that you can use to evaluate, to determine uh, how RAG is performing in your production system. So we're excited to present that for you today. Uh, just to let you know, throughout the session, you can ask your questions in the chat and we'll bring them up on the screen. And we want this to be collaborative. Um, we want this to be open and uh, discussion. So really feel free to ask your questions. And I'd love to hear from you in the chat right now. You know, are you using Langchain? Are you using Llama Index? Are, have you been fine tuning LLMs? Um, have you had any experience evaluating RAG? So, you know, let us know uh, what your experience is with RAG and um, generative AI. And what type of use cases are most important to you? Are you working on something for work? Are you working on a side project? Are you just experimenting? All right, have you put anything into production? Really interested in hearing about your use cases as well. Now, with that, uh, if you allow me, I'll just give a 30 second uh, plug on just who we are before we get started on the actual session content. So we are a vector database, KDB AI. Um, we're part of a company called KX. And KDB AI is our vector database, which you can find by going to kdb.ai in your browser. And you can sign up for free. Um, our, your account does not expire. As long as you're actively using your vector database, your instance will remain running. And you can, you can experiment with vector database uh, capabilities. We have uh, three forms of similarity search. We have some temporal pre-filtering capabilities. Um, there's a lot that you can do with our vector database. And it's just getting better every day. So. That's a little bit about who we are. And if you sign up, you'll be just given a page where you fill out a form. You'll then be given a verification email. When you verify your email, that's when your instance will be created. We were on a wait list last week due to high demand, but we are now off a wait list. We've increased our capacity of our uh, cluster so that we can support more instances. And so there should not be a wait list today if you sign up. And uh, after you verify your email, you'll, give in, you'll be given another email, uh, which shows you how to log in. So uh, when you log in, you'll be presented with a, a page where you can, you can see your API endpoints and you can generate new API keys. Make sure to record your API key so that you can continue to use that in your applications. Um, you only get visibility on that when you create the API key itself. So with that, um, I'm going to actually uh, hand it over to Michaela, and Michaela is going to talk again about uh, evaluating RAG performance. Thanks, Neil. 
Um, so yeah, as Neil said, I'm going to be talking about some different FRAG evaluation methods when working with large language models that I've come across. And I think it's important to say there's like so much happening in this space right now. There's not one clear way yet that we can say this is the way to do it. Um, and there's a lot of information floating out there. So we thought this would be a really useful topic um, because the more I dug on it, the more I was finding different ways to do it. Um, so yeah, the, the main thing, hopefully you guys can see the agenda there. I think that should be good. Yeah. The main things I'll cover today, we'll start with just a very quick refresher on RAG, just in case some of you are new to it. Um, and if you are new, please do check out our previous recordings. They're on YouTube. Um, my colleague Ryan went through with Neil exactly what RAG is in more detail and then some different approaches to it. Um, so then I'll move on and cover the importance of evaluation in enhancing RAG applications, why we need it, some of the major challenges with it. Then we get into some of the most commonly occurring metrics I've seen out there. Um, and finally, look at some of these methods, or some of the methods there are to implement these metrics from tools like Lama Index, Langchain, and also other libraries like Deep Eval and RAGAS. And they've been specifically designed to try and their specific, specific evaluation um, open source libraries. <clears throat> so we're going to look at the differences between them uh, and when you might want to use each one. Um, and then we'll end with a quick demo of a few of these methods I've been trying out so you can kind of see what they look like in practice. OK, so just a very I quick. Just, sorry yeah. to interrupt. I just wanted I forgot to mention to everyone. I know that most of our viewers watch on LinkedIn and sometimes that LinkedIn feed does reset itself and you have to refresh the page. It can be quite annoying. So if you go to KX Systems on YouTube, you will be able to find this live stream parallel streamed on YouTube, which is a little bit higher quality. There's a little bit higher quality and um, has a, a, a much more stable stream. So if you have any issues with the LinkedIn feed, check out YouTube. Sorry to interrupt, Michaela. Go ahead. No worries. Um, yes, so just a very quick refresher to get started here. This is the diagram. Again, you might have seen it in the previous talks we've had, and it's just showing a naive RAG application. So it's the most basic version you can have, really. And the basic principle of RAG is bringing in your own external data to provide a large language model with additional context. And what we want to look at today is how to make sure that our RAG application, when it's coming back with its response, is not making up things with unknown material, it's not hallucinating, for example, other than just having human finger in the air feeling from the user um, and from my own experience building out naive rag applications a lot of the time i just started out choosing typical or arbitrary values that i'd seen someone else maybe use for the various parts of our application say like the embedding models or the chunk size or the llm but if i wanted to change one of those how would i know that the change i've made is better than before so it's kind of going back to the different approaches that Ryan showed last week as well and, and how you might evaluate one against the other. So why do we need it? Um, building a fairly basic um, or naive RAG application is made really easy now with things like Langchain and Llama Index. And I'm sure a lot of you joining this call today have already done this because there's many tutorials out there for getting started. But to make your RAG system actually reliable in production is a very difficult and different challenge. So as with any application, not just RAG, we need to make sure we have a reliable system before pushing it to production. And how do we know that the responses we're getting back is good enough? Um, how do we compare different RAG approaches so we can pick the best one for our use case? Things like adding in re-ranking or the retrieval methods, maybe using parent-child ret retrieval, uh, things like agents, which again, Ryan covered. Are these making our application better or worse? Um, we also need to know which piece of our application we should be focusing on improving. And then finally, we need it because once we've deployed our application into production, we still need to continuously monitor it to make sure that performance doesn't get worse over time. So what, what makes it a bit hard, and this is, I guess, the reason why we're talking about it today, because if it was easy, we wouldn't need to spend a full half hour um, talking about it. So one of the reasons is the lack of ground truth uh, to check against. So in like more traditional NLP applications, often you need annotated data or ground truth data set to do your evaluation against. And to create this for generated responses uh, can be challenging as well as costly. Then there's like the, complex the complexity of your architecture. So even in the naive implementation diagram, you can see there's lots of different components that are required um, and ca capturing the quality of each individual piece. And then also overall is quite hard. 
and kind of combined with that, there's this retrieval piece and also the generation piece via the LLM. And that's kind of a new challenge that hasn't been solved before. So it's all very fresh and new that these new metrics are coming out. Um, also, large language models we know can inherit and amplify biases print present in the data. So trying to mitigate that um, requires some specialized approaches and thinking. The fact that if your application uses real world data, that's obviously dynamic. Different RAG models may struggle up to keep up with that. And also your evaluation metrics may struggle if you're, if you're um, the things are adapting under the hood as well. Um, also, as LLMs become larger, evaluating the scale and the efficiency, um, especially when your you know, retrieval data sets get larger, larger as well, is hard and it can be expensive. And then finally, which kind of touches back to the, the first one and the lack of ground truth there, um, when you're evaluating your RAG model and maybe you have a domain specific application such as medical or legal, you need to have domain specific expertise starting off to either create your evaluation data set um, or having some human involved to ensure that uh, your metrics are actually accurate and representing the complexity of the domain that you have. And that can be costly and require expertise as well. So yeah, the, there's a lot here, but and there's not a one size all uh, fit solution. But having said that, there um, definitely are some tools we can use to evaluate your application. And while they might not be perfect, they can get you a lot of the way there. Um, and like, as you, I'm sure everyone knows, everything's moving so fast in this space in terms of you know RAG-based systems and then the frameworks and tools that are used to create them and evaluate them. So there's gonna be new ways to do this coming all the time. Um, so what are some of the metrics? So to explain the metrics, first, I just wanna, explain back with our original naive RAG diagram where evaluation might fit into the process. So there's two main components. The first one being retrieval. And this is looking at how relevant your data coming back from your vector database or your knowledge base is. So this can be calculating things like recall, precision, uh, MRR, which is mean reciprocal rank. And these are historically used in things like search engines and recommendation systems. They usually require a source of truth to check against. Then the second piece to look at is the generation stage. So how we can evaluate, has the LLM synthesized an answer and responded to the question I've asked it? And is it a good response? And you can use metrics like rouge and blue here, which are a measure of how well the generated text matches some reference text. And there's also newer metrics like correctness, conciseness, and they actually use the concept of using a different LLM as a judge to evaluate the LLM you've used in your retrieval. So we'll be going through this in, in more detail. Um, but just to say, whether you choose whether you want to do evaluation just at a component level or consider end-to-end -end and, and multiple metrics is obviously down to you and your application. Um, so let's take a little bit more uh, of a look at retrieval and generation metrics um, in more detail. Um, so starting off with retrieval, just to explain some of those metrics, maybe some people are familiar with them, but I'm sure there's some people joining that aren't. So if we say we have an evaluation data set um, of some movie names, and we've got seven that are about superheroes and they're in orange and three that are not in white. So if we did a search on the query superhero movies against this data set, this is our evaluation test data set, and get the result in red returned in this red square, how do we measure that's a good result? So we could do recall calculation, um, which is concerned with, have you found all the relevant results that exist? So in our example, we're looking at the whole 10 um, results or the whole, whole data set of 10 and seven are about superheroes, but our retrieval was only able to pull back six of those. Um, so that's six over seven or 85%. Precision is a similar metric, but it's looking at just the relevancy of the stuff inside the red box, just the return results. So in our example, we have eight results returned and of those eight, six are relevant or in orange. Then we have hit rate, um, which is just asking of all of my eight results returned, are any relevant? And obviously they are, there's many relevant ones here. And then finally we have mean reciprocal rank, uh, which is probably the most commonly used one I've seen um, because it takes rank into account, basically meanings how quickly the first correct answer is found on average. So this would be run many times um, against a test data set. And in a, this example here, our first result return, returned is actually relevant. So that means we get a mean reciprocal rank of one over one. 
But if, for example, this was in white and it wasn't relevant, then the second one here would be our first relevant result, if that makes sense, which would be one over two. Um, so those are some of the metrics on the retrieval side that we can use. And we'll show some examples of that later. The generation side, um, we can look at an example again to explain these. So let's say an LLM has generated the summary on the left here, and we have a reference sentence on the right to check it against. So we can see these sentences, while different, are basically saying quite a similar thing. So the stunning sunset covered the sky in a gorgeous mix of hues versus the breathtaking sunset painted the sky in a beautiful blend of colors. So these metrics on the generation side, um, the first group of them, we've got rouge, blue, meteor, there are others there. And they're really trying to provide a quantitative measure of how well this text on the left matches this text on the right. And when you calculate this, and we'll see an example of this later, it provides a score back between zero and one with values going closer to one, representing that you've got a better result or more similar text. Um, in this example, we can see that Rouge might take into consideration the overall gist of the content, maybe. Um, so it's mainly used for evaluation of machine generated summaries against a reference summary. So you can think of it as more useful when you're trying to summarize um, maybe a document and compare how similar that is compared to your summary. Blue is mainly used for translation evaluation. So does the entire sentence generate um, generated match my entire reference? Um, and it considers word overlap. So it might give a slightly slower example in this example um, because it's only considering words and not really the sentence overall. They are quite similar metrics. Um, there's just some nuance between them. And then Meteor, it's more comprehensive than the first two and it gives more weight to, th to things like synonyms and stemming as well as the overall quality of the sentence. So it's got lots of different components but making up that metric. And in this example, we might get a higher score on Meteor because it's more flexible when considering synonyms like stunning and breathtaking, for example. Um, and all, all three of these, they're, they're tailored to their a specific application. The reason why they were created were, you know, was for different applications. And uh, I think people generally choose the one that best suits their, their, their needs, or they might choose to use um, a few of them, depending on what the use case is. They're a good start, but as you can probably see, they're just really surface level. Like they're just really looking at word overlap, but they're not really going into the underlying meaning or semantics of your, your data or your reference data. Um, and they don't consider broader context in which words are used. So, and they don't use an LLM to do an evaluation. Um, so these can be good, but they're probably more used for things like machine translation um, or comparing summary summaries to references. Um, but if it's for question answering, like in a RAG application, then we might want to look at some of the metrics on the next slide, which is a newer concept to emerge. Um, and it's using an LLM to do the evaluation. And it's actually been shown to be better than some of those more traditional metrics. So for example, if we take our RAG application from before and we look at our LLM that we've used to generate our responses, we might choose to use a chat or GPT 3.5. Um, and then we could introduce a second LLM like GPT 4, and that would be our evaluator. So we could pass in our user query and our response and sometimes additional things like reference context if it's needed. And then you can get it to calculate how concise or correct or relevant to the question that your response is. <coughs> So this is called LLM assisted evaluation. I've also seen it being called LLM uh, as a judge. Um, and it's definitely, I guess, the next level on from the metrics in the previous slide when considering evaluating your generation. Um, but there are some pitfalls because you're relying on an LLM to do the evaluation. So again, it's not a perfect approach. Um, so that is a quick overview of the different kinds of metrics that exist on the retrieval and the generation side. Um, I, I do have maybe, a question yeah. and it might be jumping ahead here a little bit, but uh, Madi was asking, um, does the set that you return have any statistical guarantees that will contain the most relevant answer? For example, a statement such as that will contain the most relevant context with a probability of at least 90%. Let's assume that the most relevant context exists and is well-defined. And I think that that was what we were initially kind of looking for when we were looking at RAG evaluation. But the the answer is that you have those metrics that you you showed, but 
Um, I don't believe that there's a statistical probability that you can return for any of this. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. And, um, and then he was also asking, do you return one answer as a response or a set of answers? Um, probably in a real life, you do a set of answers. Um, in, 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 I guess you're talking about the Rouge one. Um, I'm not quite sure which example you're talking about there. Um, but if, yeah, I guess you can, you can ask, ask as many, ask for as many um, responses as you want. Okay. Um, hopefully that answers your question, but chat if not, and we'll try and answer it better. Um, okay, so those are the metrics at a high level. Um, then I just wanted to go through some of the methods that um, I've seen out there that actually practically are trying to solve this. And they're basically, I mean, you can create your own metrics um, yourself, but these tools are trying to make it easier for people. So first up is what we have from Langchain. What I've seen is they mostly provide tools that use LLM evaluation and to calculate things like correctness and conciseness. So not, not much on the retrieval side from them. Um, they do also have this product called Langsmith, which is a tool to help you monitor your RAG pipeline performance, but not necessarily any new metrics as part of that. Then there's Llama Index. They have more dedicated tools to evaluation on the retrieval side. So I mainly see things like mean reciprocal rank is used there. Um, and they also have similar uh, evaluation metrics on the generation side, similar to Langchain for doing um, how good is the LLM generating my the response by using a different LLM to, to examine that and um, evaluate it. <clears throat> they also have this question generation um, toolkit, which is useful. It basically allows you to load in your document and it will use an LLM to create the questions uh, for each chunk that you have in your data set. And we actually use that in the sample I'll show soon. Um, it's pretty useful. Then there's Deep Eval. And it's an evaluation framework designed specifically for LLM applications. Um, there's a large variety here of ready to use metrics. So um, they've got, I'd say it's the next level up from the, the, gen, the evaluation metrics for generation in the other two. Um, and they're using GEVAL, um, which is taking things into consideration. Like um, I think it's doing train, train, uh, chain of thought um, and it's basically a way that you don't need as much reference data when you're running the metrics. Um, so there's a benefit there in tasks that you don't have human reference for. Um, they also provide a really easy to use framework to create your own metrics. It's based on like PyTest um, and they have a nice free front end where you can view results for like observability. Um, but yeah, most of the metrics there again are really on the generation side. Um, and then finally there's RAGAS and it's the first framework I think that's been developed specifically for RAG. Mm -hmm. It tries to work around the limitations um, of using LLMs to evaluate your RAG pipeline. And it also tries to look at it as an overall. So what we've seen in the other three is it's either looking at the retrieval stage or the generation stage separately. But what RAGAS is trying to do is it gives you scores for both of those. So it calculates things like recall relevancy and then faithfulness and answer relevancy. Um, but it also gives you one single holistic score. So it's saying it's able to pinpoint you know, which pieces of your application might be scoring lower. And then also if you change something, you have that holistic score to be able to determine overall, is it making my application better or worse? It also tries to use much less annotated data for the retrieval metrics. So in theory, that piece is cheaper um, and maybe faster if you don't have to create such a, a golden test data set. Um, but yeah, the, it does use a lot of LLM calls to actually calculate all these metrics. And it's run multiple times under the hood to make sure it's um, as good as it can be. So yeah, it's it's definitely like, I think it's the future. Like it's, it's the one that's really trying to evaluate everything in one holistic view. Um, and it means, for example, if you tried a different chunking strategy or embedding model and you improved the retriever side, but you used a different LLM model or prompt, um, you could see, you know, on the retrieval side or the generation side, which pieces I need to make better um, and which which changes have more impact. Um, so having individual metrics for each one and then overall can be great, but obviously can be expensive as well. Okay. Um, 
There I... was a, a question on um, on YouTube. So Raul was asking, would there be any sort of conflict with using the same LLM for generation and for eval? And yeah, I'll, well, I'll let you answer that. But yeah, I don't. I haven't seen that. Um, I, I don't know about conflict. I I've only I, I, what I've seen been recommended is using um, uh, LLM that's been ranked higher. Um, and there's been some research around that. There's lots of research papers about which LLM is the best and most accurate. So most commonly in all of the applications I've seen, it's GPT-4 evaluating GPT-3.5. So I assume there is some conflict there that is the reason why you wouldn't do it. Um, yeah, I would, I would assume the same, so. Um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, anything else? No, we move on. So um, I'm going to go into a quick, not really a demo, but just a bit of a showcase because I've been playing with some of these um, and I thought it might be useful for people to see a few examples. So firstly, I looked at the retrieval evaluation from Lama Index. So this calculates mean reciprocal rank and hit rate. So basically measuring how relevant that retrieval piece is. So I built a basic RAG pipeline to start off I've just hidden that code because I don't think we need to go through that today. Um, this is the piece that I was mentioning at the bottom here. So the question generation. Um, so they have this um, evaluation and generate question context pairs uh, library that they let you use, which is really useful. And it created a question for each of my chunks that I had. And there, that's my test data set that's going to be passed into my metric. Um, so when I'm calculating the mean reciprocal rank and hit rate, what I found was if I had chunks of 500, I was getting a mean reciprocal rate of 0.9244. And then I changed my chunk size to be 1,000 and I seen I got an MOR of 0.901. So inferring from that, I guess, um, having a smaller chunk size is obviously better in, in my use case here. Um, so obviously it doesn't have to be chunk size. There's lots of different things you could tweak on the RAG side, um, especially on, well, this is for the retrieval piece, um, but get, making sure that you're, retrieval piece is right in my head is the first piece because if you're getting junk back or the wrong stuff back there's no point in then evaluating the LLM response um so I think that's that's kind of the first step in my head that you'd maybe look at um and then move on to the the LLM response um yeah so that, I think I, and I think this kind of metric here actually would go a lot of a lot of the way to making sure your RAG application is achieving and you know, using all the relevant context that it has. And it would be based on how good your test data set as well is. Then with Langchain, I had a look at some of their generation metrics. They have this conciseness one. Um, it's fairly straightforward. This is my question I asked, and this is what was generated in my RAG application. So I was asking about the importance of investing in education. I chose GPT 3.5 as my LLM to generate the responses. Um, so I then used GPT-4 as my evaluator. So you can see that in here. Um, I passed GPT-4 and then I've run this load evaluator on criteria, which is conciseness, uh, passing in that LLM. And it was able to say that I get a score back of zero, um, basically saying it's not, it's not very concise. You can see a human can evaluate that and see it's quite lengthy, but here we have a quantifiable way um, for someone to or for an application to do that, is I did. Is it possible this... to zoom in just a little bit? Oh, sorry. Yeah. There we go. Is that okay. Perfect. Yeah. So here we have our question. Remember, was about the importance of investing in education. Big long response back, and it's able to reason. While my response is thorough, and the an question has been answered in terms of conciseness, the answer might not be considered ideal because there's it's lengthy and it's not straight to the point. Um, and we get a zero. These score, scores are binary, zero or one. Then I asked it a different question. How many jobs were created in the country due to um, electric vehicle manufacturing? Um, I asked this because I knew there was a specific answer in the text, so it was 11,000. When I passed that in with the correct context, so I'm using a different evaluator here, this is correctness, then we need to pass reference to use this, um, to use this metric. And when I pass the correct one, it's able to figure out, yeah, it was, I answered correctly. And then when I pass it the wrong answer, so I contradict it, um, 
obviously it gives me a score back of zero down here and tells me why that it's it's got a different answer back. So giving you some reasoning there um, and it's able to figure out if things are correct or not. Obviously the, the references that you create um, and you have to put time into that um, is required to use these as well. Um, other metrics, I just did had a quick look at the blue one here. Um, yeah, it's it's best from machine translation, as I talked about. So I had an example here, um, this original, <clears throat> or this is my machine, uh, or yeah, summary. Sorry, this is my original statement. And then I'm evaluating um, if, if an LLM created this response and it created this response, which one would it deem as better? So you can see here the precision as calculated as uh, 0.25 and 0.58. So it's saying the second one is a bit better. Um, so the actual blue score is between zero and one. Um, and then obviously precision is, they're all between zero and one, the, the precision and the brevity. And the closer you get to one means it's obviously gonna be a higher proportion of words that match the original article. Um, and then I did just pass it the identical statement and you obviously get one. So, um, but that's pretty rare in real life, I think. Um, that's just a very quick flavor of some of these methods and how they can be implemented. These are the quite basic ones, um, but they might be useful. I think they're quite par powerful as a starting point. And then obviously looking at things like DPVAL or RAGAS, maybe your second step, because um, they can give you more comprehensive answers, but they might have a higher cost associated with running them. Um, yeah, that's it for this presentation. Um, just some final thoughts to wrap up on. Obviously, evaluation doesn't stop once your application is deployed. Um, it's an ongoing process that you need to manage. And you probably need to consider having a combination of human judges and a variety of metrics to make ensure quality. It's not one or the other. Um, but my aim today was really just to put into context the different ways I've seen people are evaluating their RAG applications out there but it is changing so fast. Um, some of the most useful articles that I've been learning from and libraries um, are coming out as recently as this week and the last few weeks. So I'm sure there'll be lots more ways coming soon. Um, so it's definitely exciting to see what's happening here. Um, but yeah, hopefully this was useful and um, some of you learned something. Uh, thank you. Maybe we'll go to some questions if there's any. Yeah, no, that was it for questions, but um that was a really helpful Michaela and I, I know that there's it's a rapidly evolving space but I think you did a good job giving an overview of what's available to folks out there if you do have any questions for people out there just again go ahead and enter those into the chat um, I wanted to let everyone know that next week or next week is going to be Thanksgiving in the U.S. but the week after that we will do a session on chunking best practices for RAG applications and uh, that will be done with Ryan Sigler. Um, Ryan did our presentation last week on, uh, on RAG approaches. Uh, to, and there was a lot of questions on chunking. And chunking is one of the key areas where you can tune your RAG application. So uh, we're looking forward to that talk. And then he will be joining us again on December 6th for a conversation on agents with LLMs. Um, and on the 13th, we will be doing something on tuning RAG for production apps. It's still a working title, but we'll be talking to some different folks uh, that have put RAG into production, what it took for them in production, what type of models did they use, um, what were their uh, learnings from those models, what worked, what didn't work, uh, things like that. So a very practical session we're going to do there, uh, less on the theory side. And then um, the last session of the year will be on using Amazon Bedrock, the KPI, and Langchain. So thank you all for joining the session. Thank you, Michaela, for your, um, uh, your presentation today. And if anyone has any other questions, just put them in the chat and we will uh, answer them following the session. With that, hope everyone has a good week ahead and we will see you after the Thanksgiving holiday. Thanks. Bye. Bye.